हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनिल गुप्ता फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ जम्मू टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन द मॉड्यूल स्ट्रैटेजिक प्लानिंग एंड चेंज मैनेजमेंट फ्रॉम द पेपर स्ट्रैटेजिक मैनेजमेंट एट द एंड ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल यू विल अंडरस्टैंड अबाउट द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ चेंज विल ऑल्सो लुक इन टू द वेरियस थ्योरीज ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग द चेंज मैनेजमेंट प्रोसेस we'll also discuss about the various types of change and its importance in the strategic management we'll discuss the various driving forces of change and also we'll talk about the various sources of resistance to change we'll also highlight how the resistance can be overcome by applying few strategies students we know that strategic planning is a process whereby an organization makes choices so it's all about selecting the right kind of choices where the strategic planning plays a critical role the entire process of strategic planning helps the top management to understand what is the current situation and also allows the management to plan for the future in the world of rapid change it is becoming imperative for management to think strategically so strategic planning is a way of preparing for the future by attempting to simulate the future it's a dynamic process and it's not a static process therefore it is very much receptive to the change there are too many changes that are taking place around the organization the marketplace is changing customer preferences are continuously changing the competitive landscape is changing where the new competitors pitch in every second day with the emergence of new technologies the entire way in which the business is done keeps on changing so therefore it results in creation of new opportunities and also poses few threats there is declining financial condition etc so the number of changes that take place around the organization are too many and if the organization is not receptive to these changes it cannot actually plan itself to tackle with these changes and under this circumstances strategic planning plays a very critical role so it attempts to identify what are the significant issues so maybe all issues are not critical that will confront the organization and then simultaneously plan that how these changes are to be tackled where the organization is able to protect itself from the potential threats student let us first understand what do we mean by change what is the concept of change change basically implies the creation of imbalances in the existing pattern of situation so whatever is present today if it is not working or if there is some kind of imbalance in the existing pattern that indicates that change is really required organizations are also subject to change and so they are also required to manage change to remain profitable and effective it's important to understand that do you really want to become a subject of change do you really want to create that change there are enough research evidence that successful organizations are always proactive and rather than being the subject or victim of change they initiate change and they create change to their own advantage organizational change denotes any alteration which occurs in the overall work environment of an organization organizations really have to be very receptive in the context where they are working and then responding to those changes effectively and timely ultimately becomes a factor that results in the success of the organization so students now let us talk about what exactly is change management we have understood what change is and why is it important to manage this change process so change management is basically an approach to shifting or transitioning individuals teams and organizations from the current state to a desired stage so that transition cannot be on an ad hoc approach the entire philosophy of change management basically propagates that the change process should be a planned process 
there should be appropriate management interventions that helps in this transition because if it is managed properly the transition becomes really very smooth so we can say that the change management is an organizational process which is aimed at helping change stakeholders to accept and embrace changes in the business environment so it's about being receptive to the change it's about accepting the change and it is all about embracing the change and that is where the change management process really pitch in and helps the organizations so students change management involves the process that ensures that the business respond to the environment in which it operates reception of information from the environment is therefore very critical and the response should also be timely so it has basically three different aspects it is all about adapting to the change it's about controlling the change and it is also about affecting the change so students change management does not necessarily mean that you have to respond to the change it is not only a reactive approach but wherever there is need the companies can also effect change they can be a proactive they can take a proactive step where they effect the change in the interest of the organization so just look at that there are three patterns of the change management process on extreme left is the current situation what is the present situation and finally on the extreme right if you see it's the future that what is the desired state that the company really wants and in between is the transition phase in most of the situations it's not easy to reach the future desired state this transition part is very important which becomes the part of the change management process organizations which manage this change smoothly ensures that minimum resources are used and the resources are not wasted to reach the future desired state the level of change can be at various levels you can have an individual level change or the change can be at the departmental level team level or the group level and finally the change can be brought at the organizational level individual level changes are not difficult to achieve proper training programs can be organized at the organizational level to bring those individual level changes maybe an individual require a specific skill to achieve that task that skill can either be taught within the organization or the external agencies can be hired to impart that training for situations where the entire department or the group needs to be changed that's a slightly difficult as compared to the individual level change but when we talk of the organizational level change if the external environment has changed where the existing working of the organization is not in alignment with the expectations of the market there an organizational level change is required and such transformational changes really require proper change management practices so that a smooth transition takes place towards the desired level so to understand the change management process we can basically rely on various theories of change there are three theories which are very popular that can be relied upon the first is the kurt levin model of change the kurt levin model of change describes change as a three stage process we will see into that what these three stages are in the subsequent slides the next very popular and very contemporary change model was proposed by john p cotter according to the john p cotter change model the change has been described as a eight step change model again this is an extension of what kurt levin basically said and more steps are provided in terms of understanding the change process the last is the kubler ross model which describes change as a six stage model so let us look into the detail of each of these change models more specifically the kurt levin change model basically proposes three different stages the first stage is about unfreezing then the change actually takes place and once the change has taken place the third step according to this model is refreezing let us look into each of these dimensions minutely when we talk of unfreezing 
the first step is to determine what needs to be changed. So identification of that what is not working is a prerequisite to bring the desired change. Second step is to ensure that there is a strong support from the top management. So once those factors have been identified, the top management should be committed to bring out those changes. The third step is to create the need for change. So it's important to communicate with the people that what exactly it should be changed and how that change will really help them or the organization to improve. The fourth step is to manage and understand the doubts and concerns. Obviously, change is something that is not easy, is something that is not acceptable. So once you create the need for change, equally important is to understand what are the potential doubts and concerns of the people, those who are asked for change. Once these four things are taken into consideration, the change process actually begins. It's important to communicate often with the people, those who are expected to be changed. Obviously, during the change process, there would be too many rumors. And it's important for the top management to dispel all those rumors. It's important to empower the action among the team players. And a participative approach by involving everybody into the change process will ultimately bring long-term benefits. Once the change has been initiated and the change has been driven, it's important to refreeze that change, which is the third and the most important step of the change model. Whatever changes are brought into the people or the organization, they should be anchored into the culture of the organization. There should be enough process should be devised so that the change that has been brought in is sustained over the long run. So it's important to develop ways which help to sustain the change. Adequate support and training should be provided to all the employees so that the change remains, becomes permanent in nature. And once the change is actually brought in, it's important to celebrate the success of this change. Now let us look into the John P. Cotter 8-step change model. This model basically talks of again three major phases which are broken down into 8 steps. The first phase is creating a climate for change. Next step is engaging and enabling the organization. And the third step is implementing and sustaining the change. So if you see, this is almost somewhat similar to the, quarter, the Kurt Lewin model. However, these eight steps are very relevant to bring in the change in the contemporary times. The first step is to increase the urgency. It's important to tell people that if you do not change, you will ultimately become extinct. So that level of urgency that is brought into the people of the organization ultimate motivates people to actually bring in that change. The next step is to build the guiding team. Not everyone in the organization really want change. So it's important to identify those people, those who are motivated from within to bring that change. These people ultimately become like a guiding team and constantly motivate others to join into the change process. The third important step is to get the vision right. By getting the vision right, Cotter basically meant that it's important to communicate to everyone that what is the future state that they're really looking for. And everybody should understand the way it is intended to be. Once the vision is right, the next phase is communication for buy-in. Of course, there would be too much of resistance among certain group of people during the change process. So a good communication setup by the organization will motivate more and more people to actually come and be part of the change process. So this is a very important stage because now more and more people start joining in and the change process becomes really easy. The fifth step is to enable action. That is whatever is to be done Proper training should be given to the employees so that they are moving into the des desired phase. The sixth step is to create short-term wins. Of course, during the change process, there would be certain failures and there would be certain victories. So it's important to celebrate the change process. These short-term wins should be celebrated and should be created so that everybody becomes part of the change. The seventh step is don't let up. There is a possibility that if the change is not implemented properly, 
companies move back to their original state. So this is a stage that don't let up people to come back. And finally, make it stick. It's similar to the refreeze model that once the change has taken place, the employees should be trained enough to live a new way of working so that their desired outcome is achieved. Now let us look into the third model, that is Kubler-Ross model. According to the Kubler-Ross model, there are the following stages which is part of the change process. If you see, any, at the initial phase, there is too much of energy that is brought into the team that the change is important. But there is a shock and denial at the initial phase. Though so the change is required, but there are many people those who deny that the change is really required. And after this, there is an anger among few people and the energy levels actually come down. After that, the top management has to bargain with few of the people, those who really create problems. And ultimately, there comes a stage where there is depression, which is lowest at the stage where the change is not taking place. But slowly and gradually, once there is buy-in and there is enough motivation given to the people, that if they do not change, they will ultimately become extinct. Slowly and gradually, there is the stage of acceptance. And people start accepting that change is important, and then they grow. Companies, those who do not come out of this depression phase and do not change, ultimately become extinct. So there has to be enough push to ensure that the companies move from the shock and denial phase up to depression, and then ultimately take off so that the acceptance of change has become part of the organization. So during the change management process, what needs to be done? Number one, it's important to influence people's belief and behavior. One of the most difficult tasks is to change the beliefs of the people, though behavior is easily changeable. Second important aspect is to manage and lead the change. The role of leadership is very important to bring in the change. There has to be inspirational leadership, which constantly motivates the people that change is desirable. And then the role of the management is equally important because middle management is the one which communicates with the lower end of the staff. So both managing and leading the change is becomes an important aspect. It's important to enable individual changes to bring about group change. So if the organization is looking at organization-wide change, it has to ensure that the group changes. And to ensure that the group changes, individuals do have to change. Because groups are also made up of individuals and organizations are made up of the group. It's important to ensure that everyone joins in the change process. Though this is a very difficult phase and slowly and gradually people come in, but earlier the people join the change process, the better it is. It's important to provide strong and sensitive leadership. I'll focus on the word sensitive here because there would be various doubts and concerns during the change process. And leadership which is sensitive to the doubts and concerns will ensure that the emotion part is taken care of and the change gets implemented smoothly. It's important to help people through the transition process. Any transition process is a painful process. There are highs and lows during the change process. So enough support mechanism should be there in place where the people are helped during this change process. There can be various types of change that may be required in the organization. At the top is the strategic change, where everything needs to be changed, which means there is a change in the mission of the organization. Though vision remains status quo in the long run, we all know that mission can change. So whenever there is a change in the mission, everything down below has to be changed. The second kind of change is the structural change, which means, say for example, decentralization has to be brought in or way the organization is structured needs to be changed. Such kind of changes change the profile, roles and responsibilities and accountability of the team players. The third kind of change that can be brought in is the process-oriented change. Say, for example, if the entire manufacturing operation is changing, new technology has pitched in and the way the people have been working is changing. That is what is called as the process-oriented change. For example, we know that a decade ago, when computerization became the norm and it was introduced in various banks, the way the banking was done 
actually started changing. Today we see that with the coming up of internet-based banking or mobile apps-based banking, the way the banking is done is changing. So that is what we call as the process-oriented change. And finally, the people-oriented change. For example, people are moving towards self-actualization or there is certain other traits within the employee that need to be changed in. So that's an individual level change, which is called as the people oriented change. So if we relate the change process to our subject that is strategic management, what is required is strategic change. Strategic change is a planned change, which is necessitated by the changes in the external environment of the business. The top management makes strategies of change to cope up with the following forces in the external environment. Technology can be a major force that can force companies to change their working. The market conditions or the marketing conditions, if they change, they can become a top force influencing the top management to bring in the change. We all know that society keeps on changing on a constant basis. So the changes in the society can also motivate an organization to bring in new processes or bring in structural changes in the interest of the organization. And fourth is the political force. For example, if the government comes up and brings in new policies, which can force the companies to bring and establish processes. For example, recently we saw that with the implementation of GST in India, the working of various organizations will have to change and those changes have to be brought in into the processes and the working of the employees. So these forces can force companies to bring changes that are in the interest of the organization. The strategic change can be of four different types. The first type of strategic change that can be introduced by the organization is adaptation, which can be accommodated with the existing culture and can occur incrementally, which means you really don't have to change the culture of the organization. And there is an incremental change in the context. So companies can really adapt to the new conditions. The second possibility of strategic change is reconstruction, where there is rapid change, but without fundamentally changing the culture of the organization. So in this context, the change is rapid. But you really don't have to change the way you are actually working right now. The company is adequate enough to adapt to those changes. And it's with the minor adaptation, the change can be tackled. The third type of strategic change is revolution, where the fundamental changes both in strategy and culture. So there are incremental changes, the strategy also changes. And there is also need to change the organizational culture just to adapt to that change. And the fourth type of change is evolution, where the cultural change is required, but this can be accomplished over time. So look at what are the various types of strategic changes that can be brought. There are basically two dimensions that we consider here, as we discussed earlier. First is what is the nature of change? And second is what is the extent of change? The nature of change can either be incremental or either it can be a big bang change, which is all of a sudden something really changes very fast. And if you talk of the extent of change, it could be a simple realignment process or it could be a transformational change. So four types of changes, as I've discussed earlier, is adaptation, when the nature of change is incremental and you just need to realign. So that's an adaptation. If the change is incremental and the extent of change is transformational, you really need to evolve out of it. So that's an evolution pass. If the change is big bang and you simply need to realign, that's a reconstruction part. And finally, revolution is a big bang change requiring a transformational part is what we call as the revolution. Driving forces for change. So these driving forces are classified under two categories the internal forces and the environmental forces. So what are the internal forces that can drive the change to take place? It's the coming up of new technology. So whenever a new technology comes in, change becomes an essential part of the organization. Changing work values can also force companies to change. For example, if you look at the current generation of youngsters coming and serving the organization, 
they have different expectations they have different work values so organization which adjust to the work values of its employees will always gain more advantage there can be a need to create a new knowledge which can force companies to change whenever the product become obsolete so even if we know that successful products with the changing times become obsolete and such product obsolescence becomes a driving force for change or for example alternative work schedules can become another force that drives change if we talk of the environmental forces competition can force you to change we all know that one of the leading mobile manufacturers nokia had ultimately had to change the way of working because of the coming up of smartphones especially the android based phones that forced company to change so the external forces especially the competition can become a driving force for change changes in consumer demand we all know that consumers keep on expecting different products over a different period of time so such changes can motivate companies to change resource availability and constraints that could be another driving force that can bring into the change any change in the social and political setup can motivate companies to change we all know that with the coming of different political parties in power they have different orientations and organizations need to align to these expectations of the political setup and finally if there are changes at the international level at the global level such patterns also expect companies to change with the expectations of the market there are various sources of resistance to change and i have been discussing earlier change is something that is not easy to be bring so of course there are various resistance that need to be overcome in order to bring effective change but before we doing that it's important to know that what are the sources of these resistance the sources are classified under two categories individual factors and organizational factors among individual factors the first source can be the habit people get used to a particular working style particular environment and because of that habit they don't want to change concern for security is another factor that people don't want to change they always fear that if any change is brought in it can affect their security there can be economic factors that can motivate people not to change and of course fear of unknown people don't know that what will ultimately happen if the change is brought in so this fear of unknown can be one of the major reason why people don't want to change and finally selective information processing people don't actually listen to what is required to be changed and they do not appreciate that what are the benefits of that change at the organizational level there could be structural inertia that people don't want to change there can be group inertia that people come together and they create a kind of uh, environment that they really don't want to change they don't focus too much on change and they have a very limited focus on the benefits of change there can be a threat to established power relationships so once the change brings comes in the power relationship could change and that is why people don't want to change or there can be a threat to established resource allocation that can become a source of resistance to change so we can basically say that the sources can be classified as first is ignorance that you don't understand the situation the second source can be mistrust that you don't trust that how change would be good for you there are various motives which are considered to be suspicious there can be a disbelief that feeling that a way forward will actually not work or there can be a power cut which means that could fear could be of influence that the source and the control will be eroded during the change process so what are the strategies to overcome change these are very simple education and communication is important that is you share the logic of change participation is in important that you involve people in the change process build up support and commitment for which counseling can play a very important role implement the change fairly that is you should be procedurally fair and be consistent manipulation and cooperation that is it's important to gain cooperation from the people even if there is a need to spin the message select people who accept change that is hire people those who enjoy change and finally if need be there should also be coercion that is there should be a direct threat or should force people to actually change so what are the reasons that organizational change initiative actually fail 
there are estimates that indicate that 70% of the change initiatives fail and the major reasons for it is failure to establish the sense of urgency, failure to effectively communicate the vision of change, failure to anchor change to the organizational culture, there is no accountability that is set in, there is lack of clear ownership that who is responsible for what, adequate tools are not provided to support the change process or the people are not skilled to support the change process in the times to come. So students, let us now summarize what we have learned in this module. We discussed about that strategic planning is a dynamic process which is receptive to change. And we highlighted this very important aspect that it, it has to be an integral part of the strategic planning process. Companies should be open to what is happening in the external environment and try to build in the continuous process that really helps the company to change according to the requirements of the environment. Organizational change denotes any alteration which occurs in the overall work environment of the organization. So whenever there is a change, the organization really have to adapt to the current working, working setup. We also discussed that the change management is an approach to shifting or transitioning individuals teams and organizations from current state to a desired future state. Students, we deliberated on the fact that the change process should not be an ad hoc, ad hoc approach. Rather, it has to be a systemized process within the organization that can really help to make the transition very smooth. Then we discussed about various theories of change management which have been introduced in wide variety of subjects that are applicable in the context of organization. And some of the theories that we discussed in detail include the Kurt Lewin model of change, which talked about unfreezing, change and refreezing. Then we discussed the eight step model given by John P. Cotter. And finally, we concluded with the third model that is the Kubler-Ross model, which talks about five different stages. We also discussed about various types of changes that includes strategic change, we talked about structural change, there are changes which are related to the process of the organization and change can also be pertaining to the people. So we talked about the people oriented change. Finally, we concluded with the various sources of resistance to change, which include factors like ignorance, it can in be because of the mistrust, disbelief, and power cut. We talked about that these various sources of resistance can actually prohibit organization to change. At the end, we discussed about various strategies that can be used to overcome the resistance to change. Thank you.